There we go. All right. So chances are, if you are here, you've already been in one of the sessions this, uh, this weekend. But if not, I've got to give this little boilerplate of welcome to the WeFly Global Kite Conference. Um, uh, in general, I'll have everyone's mics muted so we can hear when one person is talking. So if you go to talk, you're going to want to uh, unmute your mic first so that we can hear you. Um, I may randomly uh, mute people's mics if we're getting a lot of feedback from your speakers coming through. Um, yeah. Other than that, uh, hi, I'm Nick O'Neill. Uh, I have uh, fortunafound.com. I also have a YouTube channel, Instagram, all sorts of good stuff. Um, and I actually, one of my side jobs is I'm a social media manager for several companies. And so I help them, uh, both generate content, manage their content, um, and curate their content. And, uh, so social media and content creation in the kite realm is very important to me. It's something I think we need a lot more of, um, both as a consumer, I want to watch more kite videos and I want to see more about kites out there. And then also from, I guess you could say the, the business side of the house is uh, the more that we have out there, um, I think the better we all become. And, and, you know, it's nice to be able to sit around and talk with other content creators or other people that are interested in it. Cause I think we can kind of help, lift each other up and grow this thing that we're doing. Um, so yeah, this is a open round table. Uh, I want to just kind of have a general chat with everybody, get your feedback, um, see, you know, things you're working on. Um, so yeah, I'm going to unpin myself. I'll open up the mic. If anyone wants to introduce themselves, tell me a little bit or tell the group about, uh, if you have social media channels or if you are uh, just a consumer, things that you enjoy seeing, um, yeah, this is your your time to promote yourselves. So let me unpin. Here we go. We got everybody. All right. Go. Someone. Devin, you don't get to sleep. <laughs> no. <laughs> I was laughing. You were like, go. <laughs> Oh, this is not Hollywood. Yeah, X we've decided again. this is how we tell Devin to shut up is everyone just puts an X in the video. <laughs> the uh, just throw it on there. Hit me with it. Um, I don't really know what to say. I'm I'm Devin. Um, um, I do a lot of, not a lot. It's usually just like when I'm asked, like just videos promoting a kite model. So like some of the premiere trick videos, all of the Skyburner videos, um, some of the indoor stuff. And most of the Blue Moon videos, except for the Exile and the Mantis, are all me on the lines. Um, there's nothing crazy with like content. It's basically just promo stuff. Um, but yeah, it's all on YouTube. Instagram is kind of becoming a little bit more kite centric. Um, but that's kind of what I'm doing. I'm looking slash dabbling into some ideas of not necessarily trick tutorials. I think there's way too many of those, but rather trick troubleshooting, um, which I think we could maybe work on as a community. Um, uh, just maybe different ways to kind of streamline some things. It's again, it's just something that I'm munching on. I've got a couple irons in the fire that need to be unironed uh, before I get into that. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to maybe getting some feedback on that soon. But that's kind of that's kind of where I'm at right now. Nice. All right, someone else. One thing I have a question about is, so if I'm trying to like uh, take a video while I'm doing a build or uh, maybe doing an applique or something like that. How do I mount the camera so that I can get everything in the view? Because normally I just, 
I would assume just use a tripod, but I would need a way to point the camera down also. And I mean, right now I just have like a, a GoPro type camera. Unmute myself for a second. Um, so I've uh, dabbled with some of these overhead shots. Um, honestly, uh, let's see. <laughs> For me, if I've done an overhead shot, I have a tripod with Gumby arms like this, and uh, I've wrapped it around a light fixture. Okay. <laughs> and so the camera's pointing straight down. Uh, you know, you just turn it so that the camera is pointing straight down. Um, the trick, though, is the light fixture swings, and so I have to hit record and then wait about three minutes for it to stop moving. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, you get seasick when you watch the video. <laughs> um, but yeah, there definitely, uh, I think there's a lot more need for uh, building videos. Um, there's some really amazing ones. Uh, oh, I, I can see it in my head. A guy in Germany did a beautiful series. Uh, is it Kieran? Um, have a look at how he shot things. Um, he time-lapsed a lot of stuff and sped up a lot of stuff uh, so that you see the whole build. Um, and his, if I remember correctly, isn't shot from directly overhead, but is shot at a 45-degree angle, which that way you get uh, body posture, you get the person, and you get the object that's happening. Is there a good... Uh are there any good free video editing softwares? Uh, I will leave that up for others to answer because I bit the bullet and I've got Adobe uh, Premiere. So I, yeah. I pay for my service. Um, honestly though, and I've got to throw a shout out to a gentleman by the name of Jim, Jim Nichols. Mm. Uh, go look him up on YouTube. The man's made about, uh, I think a thousand five hundred videos, and he gets a hundred to five hundred thousand views on his kite videos, and they are very simple. Uh, they've got what sounds like ice cream truck music in the background. Uh, like for me, I'm my mind is blown because these are not production quality, right? And sometimes here is this kite way the heck back here. Right? And it's all blue sky, and you're looking at this tiny little kite, and I'm like, how is this guy getting so many views and so much engagement? <laughs> um, Part of it's the narrative. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the narrative. Yeah, exactly. It's the narrative. And he makes a connection with people, and he's just so prolific that he's got a high relevancy rating, and so people see his stuff. Um, but make a virtual Annie kite, and he's got it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, pretty much every kite out there, uh, <laughs> especially single line. He's done a, a video of, here's this kite, here's some words across it, and here's some ice cream truck music, and there's my video. It's done. What's his name? I didn't get that before. Uh, Jim Nichols. I'll see if I can find his YouTube channel and post it here. Like I, I, I will say this, that... <laughs> I kind of use his name as like a joking curse, right? I, he's a very nice guy. And so I don't mean any offense, but you know, when I put hours and hours and hours into video and I get 30 views and damn Jim Nichols puts up an ice cream truck and gets 200,000 views. I'm like, I, <laughs> <laughs> I love him. He yeah. is a very nice guy. I've actually had chats with him uh, uh, over email. Regarding so how, like, does, how does he do it? <laughs> yeah, how do you do it? <laughs> but uh, he he just says I just create what I like, and that's that's his secret. Is it speaks to people? So, oh, got a whole bunch of folks joining. Uh, for everyone else that has uh, just joined. Um, we're just kind of going around the table and talking about what we do uh, as content creators or as content consumers, you know, what we're looking for. So uh, 
yeah, I'm going to mute my mic while I go find something. Someone else. Uh, getting back to your question, Brian, from before about the, the top-down shots. Um, in the photography space, there is, there is those light stands, and you can also get some cross beams for them. And from one of these cross beams, you can then like mount a C-clamp or something and then mount a camera, depending on which type of camera. Because for like a DSLR or something, you, you would need something more sturdy than for GoPro. And so this, this could be a way to, to get those overhead shots. I've seen that a couple of times. Not done it myself, but I've seen people having like, like a rig or something across the, the table and then mounting the camera from the top down. I'll see if I can show this. Uh, I've got a tripod. This is my tripod for my full camera, my full DSLR, and it actually does have, has an adjustable ball here that, come on, oh, there's sand in it, so that I can point a camera straight down. So if the camera is here, it'd be looking straight down. Um, I've used that for some modified overhead shots. And a friend right. of mine, he, he used to have a Manfrotto tripod where you could, where you usually mount the camera on top. This vertical, what is it, a bar? I don't know. You could make it um, sideways. So you could use that regular photo tripod and fold that arm down and then also get this overhead kind of shot if you DIY a bit and, I don't know, put it on a table to get it higher. Yeah, I can just introduce myself, if that's okay. Uh, my name is Michael from Vienna. I'm just sitting right in the middle of Vienna right now. And you guys might know the Instagram channel HQ Flight School Vienna. So that's, that's us. We are part of this community project HQ started last year. To, so you cannot buy anything from us. It's a community project where we help people we see struggling with their kites and being able to give them a, a decent kite to, to try and start with and give them some, some guidance to, yeah, to get the thing up in the air and not being frustrated with the $3 um, discounter kite. And yeah, so that's that's what we do. And we started this Instagram channel like I don't know one bit over a year ago. And yeah, keep on posting some content there. And I experimented quite a bit with using the hashtags from the locations we kite at, and I to check how many people come from from the regular following and people just coming from the hashtags. And it's interesting to see that using the hashtags can be quite powerful. And yeah, so in the future, uh, I've been thinking on working on yeah some, some beginner guides because we see people struggling with all the same things all over the place here. Though here in Austria, the, the wind is especially tricky because we don't have any coast, we don't have any ocean, so it's this constantly changing wind so it's not ideal for beginning anyway but yeah thinking about some content uh, in the beginner space to properly put their kites together it, it starts there and it starts with like figuring out which direction the wind blows it's yeah you, you probably you guys probably know watching people trying to kite and yeah that's that's what we try to help people here in vienna
Table. <laughs> so, hi, I'm uh, Mike Sherman. I live in uh, Black Earth, Wisconsin, and um, I'm currently serving as uh, president of the Wisconsin Kiters. And so, um, I've been flying kites, uh, larger kites, um, for about four years. And um, every time I go out and fly a kite, I take a video. Um, and I've uh, just been editing to music and uh, uh, really show everything from launching and releasing the kite to bringing them down to setting up to um, getting them in midair. Um, my brother does some drone footage from time to time when he visits. So we get out some big kites and do that type of stuff. Uh, and I just have a good time. So um, I've also been uh, recording some kite festivals as I make it to those and, uh, and fun flies that the club has around the state. So I have about uh, 400 followers. I primarily uh, post everything to YouTube. I'm, I'm under Michael K. Sherman. And then I, you know, just share across uh, Facebook as well. I do have an Instagram account, which doubled uh, up against uh, the kite flying experience on, on Facebook as well. So, so that's me. it's nice to meet everybody. Uh, when you're talking big kites, I uh, assume you're talking inflatables and not power. Um, what was the latter part that you said? Uh, you're talking like big Peterlin inflatables when you're talking big kites, or do you mean like power kites? Oh, um, no power kites, but you're right. They are inflatables. So uh, jellyfish, trilobite. Um, uh, I do have a Peterlin maxi gecko that is a true kite, um, not a line, piece of line laundry. And then um, I have uh, some framed kites. So I've got a uh, HQ triple X, uh, 15 square meter. And then I've got a 18 foot premier delta. Okay. And a Sutton 252 <laughs> and an HQ7 flow form. Do you also make them? I don't. I haven't learned to do that yet, but we do have uh, you make class on an annual basis that um, I think you learn to do some of that. And then we've got some people in the club that I really need to spend some time with. So I think that's one uh, thing I'd really like to see uh, posted if it's possible just by anybody out there is uh, um, kind of some introductory how to make inflatables. I feel like there isn't a lot of information out there right now. I mean, I found several templates like the um, Robbie, the uh, the whale, I think. And there's also a parrot one, but it doesn't. It gives you some instruction, but um, you're really on your own to figure out how to do it. I kind of have a, a general question um, is what, what is something, <laughs> what is something that you worked on um, that you thought was really going to make a difference and got no reach, no con like no engagement. Um, you know, was it a video or, uh, or is there something that you you saw that you're surprised that more people haven't engaged with as a consumer or as a creator? That's a good question. Thinking, thinking, thinking. Okay, there's a few. And they're not anything that I've made, but there's small videos that I've seen. That are like, like what? Like, like how is this not a staple? Um, I know like kite ballet and stuff is like f fairly dead, um, <clears throat> but there are, there are so many just clips of just random demos and everything online. There are two 
that stand out night and day. Um, 2010, Chris Goff. Um, I probably shouldn't quote the song that he's flying to because it's just covered in profanity. Um, but he's flying a Fury 8.5 with a reverse turbo bridle. And this demo, it's the first time he ever flew to the music. It is insane. It's a free fly. Um, he also does one with a super fly that's pretty good, um, but it's not full length. Um, the other one is, um, I might botch his name, uh, Matthew Maye, M-A-Y-E-T. He's flying a mask, uh, just a purple mask, to Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And like those two things, Chris's is obviously he heavily trick influenced, but like Matt's is insane. And to have these, like frankly, like these, these two videos kind of like go off the wayside. Some of them, like, I think maybe have like 100 or 200 views and they've been around since 2007. <laughs> like, videos are, um, put the links to the videos in the chat. Yeah, I will. Let me dig for him. That's the other thing is that Chris's is so hard to find. Um, Matt's comes up pretty easily, but it's it's crazy. It's sad that these are all buried just due to the sheer amount of content. But I mean, I guess that's good in and of itself, but it's kind of a hard thing to hit. Yeah, Chris's YouTube channel is good too. Um, let me mute myself and I'm going to go into the depths of YouTube. Um, I'll get him in the chat soon. Yeah, from uh, the social media manager side, I can say that um, trying to understand and adapt to the algorithms that dictate, be it Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitch, uh, Periscope, all of those, um, those are, it's difficult. Uh, that's a adaptive algorithm that is constantly changing and the amount of content that is loaded every minute is massive and us trying to, uh, you know, get eyeballs on kite content from the general, you know, population is, is rather difficult. Um, and so where it's probably better, for us is to be super targeted on kite people. Now, uh, this is how I feel and, and what I've seen, and I'm happy to hear other people's beliefs, but there is a, there's a huge disparity between our traditional kite community and say the new folks coming in to the kite world. Um, the traditional kite community generally does not consume the type of content that we're creating. Um, they don't know how to find it unless it is literally spoon fed to them. Like, here is my video, watch it. No, I mean, right here, I'm going to put the phone in front of your face. So you have to watch it type of thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm noticing that, I, I, I see what you mean. <laughs> yeah, and it's, you know, uh, it, in my household, it's the joke of everyone wants to show you their baby photo and they're like, baby, 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 and they're slapping it in your face. And you almost have to do that uh, with the type of content we create in the somewhat traditional kite community. Um, and I'm going to say it's generational, but that's not age-based. That's, that's mindset-based. Um, so it then becomes difficult of like, who exactly are we targeting? Are we targeting all the new people that might be coming in whose attention is, I have, I'm looking over here and 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 oh yeah, there's kites, that's cool. But, you know, it's really hard to snag their attention away or are we trying to educate the existing population into what we're doing and, and bring them in and be like, no, seriously, please watch my video. I feel kind of bad because I'm like, please watch it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to respond to that. Um, I, you know, so you, you asked about surprises and then you talked a little bit about the algorithm. So I feel like I have some pretty good um, festival videos that I've taken over the last few years, but there's two of them that have really taken off. Um, and I think it has a lot to do with the fact that they're kite festivals and that, that um, those words are being used and somehow they're, they're in the recommended videos. And so the, the, 
the, the winter one I did in uh, February, it's just seven months old now, has 37,000 views. And that's just cycling all the time. I, and, and I noticed that it's gotten picked up in Malaysia over the last three or four months. So I think the bulk of the viewers I'm getting are from Malaysia. The other one was three years ago, and that has 31 or 32,000 views. And that just gets cycled regularly as well. And so I'm miffed because I feel like the last one I released, which was Kites Over Lake Michigan, was pretty good. Although it's 10 minutes, it's kind of long and it's pretty slow as it starts out. And so unless you've got, I think, fast action, big kites, the right terminology, kite festivals, which is what people want to see, that seems to be the number one, as I look in the analytics, the number one typed in research uh, thing um, that seems to be driving it, but I, I don't know what else to else to attribute to that other than you just got to catch people's attention right out of the gate and you've got to have a good um, cover shot or, and I'm not using the right term, but your thumbnail needs to be enticing. So, and this last one, I had been switching thumbnails. So after I had posted on Facebook and everything, I thought, well, maybe I'll switch it up and see if that drives any more views. I don't know that I kept it long enough. But when I switch it, it switches a few days later on Facebook. And then I decided I went ahead and switched it back to the one I originally had because I thought it was best. So it'll be interesting to see how it does over time. But I think Kites Over Lake Michigan will probably top out at a thousand views. I'm at 941 right now, and it was two weeks ago. And the last two uh, festivals of that particular one topped out around one or two thousand. So, so it just you just have to. And then I think if you're if you're fast out of the gate and people really like what you have, they share it a lot. And then when they share it a lot, that helps the algorithm. And then um, I think you live off of that for a long, long time. So that's just my rudimentary insight. <laughs> so is that specifically for YouTube or do you also see that on Instagram? Just YouTube. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Jim, you wanted to Hi, say something? Yes. Uh, well, thank you so much this morning. Well, um, so I have a confession to make because you mentioned that traditional audience of kite flyers, and I'm an older folk, so I fit into that first camp. But I've also worked in technology for 20 years at Wacom Technology, which are the pen tablet manufacturers, you know, for Wacom tablets. If anybody actually designs kites using a Wacom tablet, let me know because we could maybe do something interesting there. But quite frankly, kite flying has been my therapy to get away from looking at computers, to avoid Windows Update, to put down my phone, and actually this morning I'm using my Galaxy Note as a Wi-Fi hotspot, you know, to access this on through my computer. And the Galaxy Note uses an S Pen, which is a Wacom pen. We make the S Pen for Samsung. And so the, the Wacom uh, business side of this thing, which I get away from by going kite flying, might be a place that Nick may want to talk to because our Wacom Experience Center is run by Megan Davis, and she could be involved with you and I won't have to do anything. I will avoid this like the plague, which I already have because, um, you know, like I said, I try to get away from technology by going kite flying. But what you're doing is super important. And Megan does a series of creative uh, activities online using Twitch TV, which is um, a, what a lot of our uh, more advanced, you know, designers and graphic artists, animators, people that use Wacom tablets, uh, subscribe to those channels. and. And I joined those just to watch. I, I, I've not presented anything because, like, the last thing I want to do is spend another weekend in front of a computer. But, um, but anyway, Nowaka has been a great place for me to work over 20 years. It helped me go to Asia on different um, exchanges through the company. And it allowed me to go to Beijing for six weeks about 10 years ago and work out of their office. And naturally, on the weekend, I would escape tech and go find a Chinese kite somewhere. <laughs> And, and, and But anyway, this, this conference has been super fantastic because um, I've been so enjoying just joining these sessions and um, without and slightly knowing the work that Nick's doing, 
but I'm so happy not to actually have to be on the backside of this because it's a lot of work to do all this for several days and have a smile on your face. That's amazing. So thank you. And let's talk again later about a walk-in connection, which I will just put you in touch with somebody and stay well away from the actual managing of this sort of thing. Uh, and it's great to hear that uh, Michael from Austria and various other guests from far away, because uh, I'm sitting in a little cabin just down the road from the Long Beach Kite Museum. Uh, and uh, so I'm, I'm a local for sure. <laughs> but anyway, thanks again. We'll talk later. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, kind of the ment uh, jumping back somewhat. Um, there was a, a mention of the the YouTube channels and and our exposure and our reach, um, and something that I use as a constant example when I was doing like social media workshops and stuff at conventions was I would ask the room, "What are the number one views of all time for kites?" on YouTube. Um, at the time, this was before that octopus kite one came out. So, <laughs> which is up at, I think I last saw the original is up at 16 million unique views. Um, so that's, that's fairly prolific. Uh, that's a viral video. That's a whole different level of what we're going to get involved with. Um, but the Brazilians and the Indians are putting out at 3.3 million. And the type of kite flying that most of us do that are in this room, uh, the highest rated one is right now at 1.6 million. And that's the Spencer Watson video. Um, indoor, uh, let's see, I think I had it up. I'm sure you guys have, have seen this. I'm not going to play the video, but just to kind of give you an idea of what it looks like. Uh, it's this video, the Spencer Watson, a.k.a. Open Indoor Unlimited Competition. Um, there's nothing really fancy about it. I mean, yes, Wadi did an amazing job and uh, <laughs> did great at flying, uh, but it's inside a gym. It's not a high production video. Uh, Matthew Seifert from uh, Ocean Shores, Washington nowadays, uh, shot it and uh, put it online. And it got, it actually got picked up by a joke site. Someone kind of making fun of it and saying like, oh, I get, I bet this guy doesn't get any. Uh, and it ran with that, but uh <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, and John, you probably remember some of the story behind uh, how people were kind of making fun of Wadi online. And he just, he, he dug in with it, though. He went with it. And he's like, yeah, well, you know, you can make fun of me, but 1.6 million views, people watching me do my thing. So, uh, but it's, it's something I try to take away is that each one of these videos that has the high view count and you know michael like you were talking about it's making a connection with the audience uh so it's not necessarily telling our story as much as connecting with the audience and trying to have that conversation with them even though it's not live yeah so i absolutely agree so i do have like one video that's just like any other video that i posted um, how to fly a, a 19 foot Delta kite with no wind makes you curious, <laughs> uh, but it has, you know, maybe like 700 views over the last few months. I mean, that's not very many, but by comparison to my other ones, people were interested in it. If you look at Billy Eck, um, he's got some great, um, videos as well. Um, I think it's the Wildwood Kite F Festival just from three years ago. It's 693,000 views. Um, and he's using everything from the Kite Festival report as being his channel to, you know, Kite Festival in the title of his videos. And then he's got, you know, big inflatable line laundry for his um, thumbnails. So, you know, he's just riding on the whole Kite Fest, the interest in that. So... Yeah, John uh, put in the comments that uh, 
Uh, there's also something to be said for the hater comments. It's still engagement, which is true. Uh, right. It means not only did they watch it, they took the time to type out a response. So you, you've brought them in and you've engaged them. And from the, you know, the behind the scenes side, uh, that increases your relevancy. Uh, and so YouTube sees that the more people that are commenting, the more engaging it is because they would rather have you. YouTube wants people, you know, watching, right? Uh, same with Facebook and all these, but we're going to use YouTube specific. They want people watching because then they might be able to put ads in front of them. And the best way to see that people are watching is view time and engagement. Um, and so it's, it's hard when you're reading some of the hater comments, um, especially when it comes to kite flying, right? I just put up a kite. It's beautiful. It's fun. And people come in and they may say, I, I don't know that you've had this yet, Michael, but people be like, wow, this is the stupidest shit I've ever seen. And it's like, hey, okay. Right? And I, I think that's an important point as, you know, as, as any sort of creator is um, ahead of time. You want to really conceptualize that, um, prepare yourself for that because there's always that element, particularly when you when you shine, as it were, or you you kind of hit a peak with whatever you've put out, um, you got to embrace it and not take any of it personally and understand that there's always a quotient of humanity that's going to respond in that certain way. Once you add yeah. that many bodies into a room, <laughs> you're going to have this percentage of a-holes and this percentage of saints and, and so on. You just got to embrace that and, and kind of play to it and, and just don't take it personally. I agree. I agree. Yeah, I, I embrace a comment that I got. Uh, when I was hmm, former AKA president, uh, that I was a petulant little schoolgirl. Um, that was the fav my favorite insult that was thrown my way, and I was like, "Yeah, okay, cool. I'm gonna run with it, and I'm gonna own that." You want me to get in like exactly? You want me to like dress up like a schoolgirl? <laughs> I'm gonna school the shit out of you for calling <laughs> that. Like, you're not hurting me, bro. Like, let's go. Um, but yeah, it's, it is, that's kind of the nasty side of it, uh, is just completely changing like your framework of how you see these things. So, uh, sorry, I'm watching my clock cause I got to start another session soon. And I really hate that. I kind of had to double book this one because the next session is someone in Europe. So I had to do it earlier in the morning. Um, but, uh, so before we get too far onto, maybe another topic. Uh, would you guys be interested in kind of having a somewhat regular content creators chat where we could maybe uh, talk with one another, support each other's projects, maybe help in each other's projects type of thing? Um, or if someone sees an opportunity and they're like, hey, you know, I can't take advantage of this, but man, this needs to happen. You know, like one of, we could hand it off and I could be like, Dude, Michael, I can't do large kites. You got this. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know. Oh, yes, you can. <laughs> uh, but yeah, if, if you guys would be interested, awesome. All right, I'll, I'll definitely figure out a way to set it up so that we can yeah. kind of have this routine. I think it'd be kind of fun. Yeah, it'd, it'd be educational as well, I think. Just mm -hmm. to learn from others. Yep. Can I ask one thing really quick? Yeah. This is like a different side of engagement. So I've been, now that we're, you know, we're all in like Corona City, um, I, I've been talking to these new people about what's missing online. Um, specifically, some of my really good friends, like in the horn world, like, you know, we're all like performing artists and they're like, okay, so this is it, you know, yada, yada, yada. I, this is what I'm missing when I'm looking for information. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them have noticed, I can only speak for the dual line world. Um, they're all seeing, you know, these videos of like Richard Debray and, you know, the slash from La Atelier, like all of this stuff. And they're like, yeah, these kites are great. And then they start to notice that people will buy the kites because, you know, this person that designed them is a big name, which is already tough territory. And then all of a sudden they started to delve down this path saying like, okay, we're starting to see comments of people that know what they're doing saying that they can tell whether or not that they would vote with a model 
based off of its characteristics in the video. And they're sitting here going, okay, well, where's the video on that? Yeah. Um, wait, and I think that's totally valid. <laughs> like, is that, what's happening? Oh, hello, child. So, <laughs> Devin, <laughs> um, Devin, are you saying video on the characteristics, addressing the characteristics of the kite? Yeah, so they're saying like, okay, uh, actually I was just talking to someone like about the spur video. They were saying like, well, it looks like the toe points, for example, are pretty low. The kite's gonna fly in this way. Um, John Baresi picked up on the way at corners. Like these things that we see very, very easily that these people that are getting in, you know, getting into the kiting industry and they're, they wanna drop like anywhere between 200 and God knows how much money on a kite, especially with exchange rates. And they're just looking at this video going like, yeah, it looks great. Like, you know, when this person that could quite literally fly a brick is flying a kite, but like, they don't know, <laughs> like, you know, um, and I started to talk to them about it and they're like, yeah, but how do you, how do you tell that you will be able to build with this kite or not? How can you tell? And I was like, well, that's, that's just, you know, thing that you acquire. And they're like, well, can we talk about it? I wonder if there could be, is, do you guys think there's any worth in a video series or maybe just a couple blurbs on what to look for in a kiting video? Like if you're in the market for a kite, not just watching. Yeah, I, I would, I would venture to say that there's lots of talk about like the different kites and kind of what they're good at, but I don't think that anybody's ever really done an expose on the types of kites, the genres, the different kinds of engines. This is a sports car. This is an off-road car. Like, what is it? You know, where do those roads go as opposed to just looking at one kite one-on-one -on -one and, and trying to qualify it or disqualify it? I, I'm, I'd, I'd like to see that myself. Okay. And what I think you find online a bit more the, the better or more production heavy videos are about more expensive dual line kites and i haven't seen too much content for like beginner kites and to help a beginner who gets into the sport or hobby to to like choose i either see like people flying relatively expensive kites or like discounter kites and what do you what do you guys think do we need some some more content in that beginner section how to properly choose a kite for which kind of wind and so on there's but a lot of we... uh, i want to jump in just for a tiny moment on that michael is yeah. um I, it, i'm stimulated because i think we as a community um have an opportunity to uh, to put manufacturers kind of on the spot with these videos and and we know that a lot of these manufacturers are producing kites not because they are daily kite flyers like even close to us they're just business people they're trying to make products to fill niches yeah. and so a lot of times if we can create content like this and identify these points we can almost shame them or educate them into a position where they're making better product and, and even presenting it better I, I would like to see that as well and there is a lot of that content out here already. It's just locked up in forums and Facebook posts and Reddit and just yeah. little places. Yeah. There's no uh, curated, here's where you go. We need that. And uh, what I see on Instagram especially, there is, there is quite some amount of kite content, but I feel it, it could be a lot better quality, like, especially comparing to stuff like kite surfing which of course has way more money and way more business behind it. But you see way better quality in the kite surfing world, even from like singing creators. And so I think we can definitely step up the game here as well. That's what, I'm, what we are trying to do to a certain extent. And so like shooting pictures with a DSLR and things like that to get some more quality content out there. And also like things like using proper hashtags. It's that's what we experienced and tried out in the last year. Yeah, so I'll, I'll jump in on on that a little bit. So, um, yeah, I haven't really produced content in kiting wise in, in quite a while, but um, over the past couple of years, I've become pretty intrigued by like the full time content creators that are on say YouTube. 
Um, you got Mark Roper, who was a NASA scientist or NASA, NASA engineer, left his NASA job and does YouTube full time, making 12 videos a year. And I try and look at that and I go, you know, and he's doing all the science stuff. But he but the thing that I think stands out is um, he's a great storyteller. You know, he is telling a story and he does it through a great, you know, he, he's very good at his video editing and he does it in a, in a great way that that is engaging and funny and entertaining. And so I think it goes back to like, how can we present kites in a, you know, in, in this kind of format that is, is great storytelling and, and very engaging to the public and in that type of way. And um, it's very intriguing to me and I don't, I don't have the answer, but I feel like that's something that's just a stood out when I look at, when I look at some of these, um, full-time content creators on YouTube and how they're doing it. I mean, obviously they're extremely good at what they're doing and as they earn more money, they're able to have film crews that help them and professionals and do extremely high quality. But I don't know. I, I think it's the storytelling. How do you make it super engaging? I think there's a, a key there is recognizing the different audiences. I mean, yeah, there is one audience that's the, the uh, demo. I mean, the, the tutorials, the how to's, the guides, those are important. That's an audience. There's a second audience around these longer, um, the, the actual here's a flight demo, here's from a show. But right now the mass appeal is these less than a minute, short, emotional, storytelling, cute, exciting, shocking, whatever, the one minute clips like you see on TikTok. And that's where the engagement's at. Yeah, I mean, I, I fully agree with that. I remember when I was making videos, it's like you're sitting there pulling together content, all of a sudden you've got this 10 minute video and you know that you know, you've got someone that you're dealing with that has a super short attention span and you've got to, uh, you know, cut that down to be way shorter. Um, so I fully agree. And I think even since that time period that I was doing that, the attention spans are even less, like you say, with the TikTok type video and everything. And I think there's a great opportunity there. I think you could do some short, really cool TikTok videos. Yeah, and all of them are important. I mean, that's not one. Well, it's not important. It's that, I mean, you need the tutorials, you need the guides to choosing a kite, and those those are long, depth, in depth content. But you also need the here is me flying a kite for thirty seconds that gets put to cheesy music. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm amazed at how many kites are out there uh, for sale, and I can't find one of them at times online just to see what it looks like and how it performs. <laughs> so, and if, and if there is a video posted, it's, it's somebody who's just got a shaky camera and it's way up there and I can't, I can't see a thing. So that's part of the reason I started doing it. I mean, I didn't even know there were big kites like this until a few years ago when I got to a kite festival and saw them. And I was like, and how come I've never seen these things before? <laughs> so I don't know. Hey, real quick, uh, Mohammed has a question, and I'm going to mute myself for a little bit while I get the next session started. Yeah, uh, thank you, Nick, uh, for providing me uh, in such a time. And uh, hi, all. Uh, my name is Mohammed Shahir. I am from India. Uh, my doubt to uh, Mr. Uh, John, John Beresi. Uh, I'm uh, a beginner in uh, revokites, means uh, the four-line court kites. So can you tell me uh, which is the uh, convenient, what is the convenient length of uh, bridle to fly for a beginner in court kites? Uh, namaste, Mohammed. Um, I, I appreciate the question very much, um, but I, I'm going to remind us all that the, the format for this meeting is about content creation online. So um, I encourage you to send me a private message in Facebook or somewhere else for that information. Will you do that? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. JB, okay. thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Mohammed. When, when thinking about it now, there is, whenever a new gadget product, whatever comes out, there is tons of review videos on YouTube from lots and lots of creators. Is there anything or has there ever been anything similar when it comes to kites? I cannot recall I've seen like a kite review video in the classical sense of a review video. I'm not sure if there's, a, there's an audience for that or if it would be a good idea to do something like that. 
there's a lot of them that come out that they're just like I was saying they're small there there's you have to look for that specific kite and it may or may not exist but it'll be on somebody's forum or it'll be on a YouTube video of here's my first day or my initial flight or here's my unboxing and it's not a curated content it's not a a uh, organized system um, I, I'd like to speak in on that because in, in, in the nineties, we had a lot of reviews and things coming out through the printed magazines and such, because we had such an audience that there were so many opinions that we could sort of sustain those, those sorts of reviews. But now, um, so, hey, but the, the community is so small now and so personal that I think a lot of people have shied away from doing those reviews. Um, so I think that's one of the dynamics. Um, with such a small audience, we just like kind of afraid of pissing each other off, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I agree. I, th I think I think it's a really interesting idea to be doing like an unboxing review in first flight. Um, you know, and I compare it to like you're saying the technology world. I mean, I, I worked in the mobile device industry for a while, and it's like everyone has a cell phone. So when a new cell phone comes out and they do an unboxing review, it's just millions upon millions of interested parties. Kites is just such a smaller market. I'm not saying I wouldn't love to see it. I think it'd be great, and I think it could be done well. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. It's you know, it's a totally different market. Just my extremely niche market versus the tech world, which is massive. Uh, there is a YouTube channel called Kite Builders where they've done some decent reviews by a fellow named Ralph Dietrich out of Germany. I've also seen like one German guy who who did like beginner, not, not guides, but like introduction of different foil kites or I don't know how to call them in English. So not, not frame kites, but uh, foil ones. And to give beginners a, a little direction what's different or, or good about a certain kite and and I wrote him a message, but he didn't reply. He stopped posting on YouTube a couple of years ago. And I would love to hear his about his journey, but unfortunately he didn't reply to me. I don't know if it's the same guy you just mentioned. I'm not sure. And then Nick mentioned Jim Nichols out of New Zealand. Um, again, he has 1500 videos and he essentially does review all the kites that he flies. He gives his opinion. Uh, whether he thinks they're go of good quality and and whether they uh, what the performance is like, it's not in detail. But for the audience that you're talking about and the, the short attention span, I think it fits the bill. Right, and there's another like uh, there's a, a shop, Big Mike's Kites, and he's got a bunch of videos that are just they're really short, sweet, two three minutes long for each of the kites that he sells in his shop. Or for a bunch of them, not all of them, but that's just the example. It doesn't have to be a lot, but people are creating the content. It exists out there. It's just not curated. Uh, there's another site called, um, I think a lot of the sites that Big Mike used to sell, I think it may be confusing it with another shop, but I think his shut down, the actual shop. Um, Extremekites.co.uk, I'm sorry. Extremekites.org or um, powerkiteforum.com also does a lot of reviews um, from people that are fairly experienced and some people that aren't. Um, like I did a review, I would definitely consider myself a novice to intermediate on powerkites. I did a review on the Montana by HQ a few years ago. But I mean, uh, and those forums are open to anybody to do reviews. So you get a lot of differing experience levels and authorities. Um, there, there's also a kiteclick.com. They, they don't really do video content, but they, I think, have some of the, the sportiest looking um, uh, reviews on, on, on high-end exotic kites that I've seen around. So I think one of the challenges that I run into is 
beyond time um, is uh, like I'm, I'm here uh, uh, by myself. It almost goes back to some of the progression that we talked about yesterday with flyers. I mean, it's more fun when you've got someone to do it with. You know, it becomes a challenge when uh, you, you've got these ideas of how you can do this content creation, but you're the only one who can fly it slash film it and you know, got the vision and all that kind of stuff. So I don't know if anyone either has any tips for that. I know, you know uh, uh, Bressy, I've you know, commented on a couple of the videos that you've done. I mean, I very much respect the amount of work that goes into some of those, knowing that you're the guy who filmed it, flew it and did everything with it. Um, and, and it's challenging. Um, so any tips there, anyone? I'm trying to educate my girlfriend how to film a bit. <laughs> To, to come around that exact same issue. If it I makes don't... you feel better, Hunter, trying to do that even with, you know, access to Paul is damn near impossible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah it, it, it requires relentless devotion and pestering and constantly just going out and, and doing it and trying to, you know, balance that with, uh, all of my other like requirements um it's it's a it's difficult <laughs> the, the the only thing hunter that i found that that helps me is immersing myself in the things i mean granted it's not one-on-one -on -one, but like interacting with new flyers and beginners every day all day and really digging into the content um it, it reminds me why and it excites me why and it makes me think about the things that i'm doing um it, you know, being alone, you're, you're spot on. It's the only reason that I can get up and do the things that I do is just because I'm, I'm motivated from the inside, not from the top down. It's funny you mentioned Snapchat. Um, I've, I was on Snapchat for a while with, uh, tr trying to engage with others. Um, and I guess my problem is that it was taking up so much time. Uh, I was needing to just constantly respond to people and, and be on it all the time. Um, and I don't know. For me, that felt a little invasive just with everything else that I've got going on. Uh, I don't know if anyone else has used Snapchat. Um. I guess I'm referring more towards like being that one person in the area and like not like maybe having a little bit of time, but just like not really wanting to go out because it's like, oh, like, this is hard. <laughs> like, you know, like or something like that. But to have you know, like a kiter, even on Snapchat, like not as this big institution, but just like your friends on Snapchat. Or like if I wake up in the morning and I like I just recently got like a, a picture over text from Carl Robertshaw, who was sewing a new sale, like just something like that, that little like kind of one on one thing. If you can have, you know, five or six people like in your pocket to, to do that for you and to have that, you know, obviously returned back at them is super helpful. Like to kind of give you that initial like kick right in the ass to like just get out and start something even if it's just flying without filming like that's still a step like the next time out you can just bring a camera and like you know dick around but that little bit of like personal spark like that for me has been really helpful so kind of i'll build off of that i mean it just kind of made me feel like you know in thinking about it i think everything that just was said was great and and spot on and like i've mentioned before i mean even being involved in these chats yesterday and today have been motivating to want to kind of do stuff and everything and nick i don't know if you've already done it or if anyone else already has or have thought about it but from the content creation side maybe it's like you know creating some kind of little challenge on creating the best one minute clip whether it be a tiktok style clip or it's a youtube or whatever but and then maybe it's like a monthly kind of thing. And it's this group that you're talking about putting together, it becomes a thing like, hey, everyone put it together. Let's try to have it done by a particular date. And we'll all get on and we'll we'll watch each other's and react and be supportive, not necessarily critical or overly critical, but be supportive and just a little challenge. 
It could be fun. <laughs> Guys, Funny I'm running news. low on battery. I gotta go. Oh, see ya. <laughs> Bye. Nice to meet you, Michael. It's Bye. funny you say that because in the sport kite chat uh, last night, we came up with a challenge idea. I don't know if you heard it. The walk of shame touchdown dance. Yeah, that's going to happen. <laughs> We're going to make that happen. <laughs> um, is if your kite goes down, you got to walk the whole line and do your best touchdown dance to the end of the kite. And that's something, though, that, you know, just thinking and looking at this group, we can open that up beyond just sport kite flyers. Like, Michael, I'm going to ask you, you know, you got a big lifter crashes into the ground. You got to do a touchdown dance along 500 feet of line. <laughs> yeah, well, I've got all kinds of footage of things in trees and coming down. You don't see any of that. <laughs> All right, let me uh, get this other session uh, kicked off real quick. Uh, I will be back in just a second. Hey John, I'm I'm curious. I know you uh you had gotten a drone at one point. We're doing some some drone footage and everything. How's how's that going? Um, you're using the drone in order to capture you know content and and then you know make it into usable videos and all that. Um, I'm using my drone pretty minimally. Um, it really, it's just a flying camera for me because it just doesn't turn me on at all the drone thing. But um, sure. Uh, I kind of tapped out the, the first angles that I wanted to do individually. Um, I want to use it in the middle of team flying, uh, quad team, especially because of the, the ability to have those static formations in the air. You could actually fly the drone and the camera through some of the, the balls and the rings. Um, I think that would be some amazing like top level footage that, that would get some of the same attention that the octopus videos got. It's that mm -hmm. ethereal, like what the hell am I looking at kind of view. Um, the other one that I want to do is a tutorial on uh, doing a 360, how the, the, the run is actually not a circle, but more like a snail shell. Um, and also for dog steak, um, one aspect of the dog steak tutorials. So those are two perspectives. But other than that, um, I haven't I don't really have anything in the pipeline for new content um, using the drones. And have you found that it to be a, quite a challenge to again have to be the drone pilot as well as then be the flyer? Or you, you, I guess you're trying to get. Are you talking about trying to get into those situations where you've got say a team around that you can step away, they can handle the, the flying, and then you can, can do the drone shots that you're looking for? I, I, frankly, I'd rather not touch the drone. I'd rather be flying. Um, I'd rather be leading the team and then coordinating that group so that the drone can move through it and, and coordinating with that drone pilot. Um, otherwise, what I've been doing individually is I just set it on the on the auto cycle using either um, point of focus or uh, active tracking. Uh, the latter is kind of challenging. Um, and then for the other stuff, obviously, I'll just put it in a particular spot, leave it there, and then and then point it. Um, but I always, I'm always scared walking away from my remote, so I have it sitting somewhere where I can run to it if I see the thing taken off to see. Yeah. Did I answer that? Yeah, you sure did, definitely. Oh, okay. <laughs> So I guess I'll, I'll keep building on that maybe while we're waiting on Nick to get back. But so I guess what type of what type of cameras are people finding to be the most useful? Is it is it mostly your your phone? Is it your GoPro or do you have a, a DSLR that does video that you're taking video content on? What what are people finding to be the most useful? This um, one's, oh, Michael, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just saying I'm currently using an old phone. I'm using a Galaxy S5, which just kind of died on me. So I'm probably going to get a new one, but I'm using my phone exclusively. Um. um Second that. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Mm, I, I just real quick. Um, I'm using my my phone. Just upgraded to the a new iPhone. Um, most of the time, just because of convenience and the quality is so good these days. But um, for a lot of the other stuff, I'm using two GoPros with the with the remote that triggers them both at the same time. And I really mm -hmm. like that because you can be getting one live action and then later in editing, pop over to the other angle. It just makes it really seamless and sexy. Nice. Uh, 
going to second the phone thing. Um, I've actually asked people that have been curious about like putting their flying online or doing all of this. And they're like, well, we don't have, you know, the camera. And you're like, blah, blah, blah. And it was actually because of that stereotype that someone mentioned earlier. I think he actually just left. Um, that the really like top tier kite videos are using, I guess, a bit more primitive equipment, if you will. And like, it doesn't take much to just slap a phone on a tripod, put that tripod around, I don't know, like a gazebo column and film a TAS machine. Um, which is kind of going back to that TikTok video. And I've actually been kind of firm over the years, like when John and I film stuff um, about filming it with pretty just average equipment, because that stereotype can somehow become intimidating. Uh, you, you're hitting on something kind of interesting here, Devin, is that um, a lot of times professional content doesn't take off, but this, this rough shoddy camera from the audience angle it just goes crazy viral we don't know why that is exactly except that it's, it's really organic so um being really crisp and professional isn't always the best path yeah well i mean do we do we look back at for those who are old enough to remember at the blair witch project yeah you know, uh, from a movie standpoint you know they made it look rough and real and boy did it take uh, off the cloverfield yeah and that whole movie was done on a a store bought camera, I believe. And I mean, and some of the effects on that were just like at the very end, they dropped the camera from a crane to get the effect of a guy falling from the air. I mean, you could do a lot of tricks with the camera. You just kind of have to think outside the box, I guess. Yeah. I don't know if that helps at all. No, it totally does. Definitely. So then uh, when you're creating your content, uh, if you are putting music on it, uh, I mean, if I'm not mistaken, you, know, you run into issues like with certain platforms where if you're putting a copywritten song on there, it's you're know, going to. Uh, get dinged or removed or the song's going to get muted um that kind of thing how, how are you is anyone doing anything when it comes to i guess do you have um i, I guess copyright free music sites that you're using or anything like that when it comes to music overlay so say i'm just using youtube's library they have an audio library so and i'll i'll, I'll filter through there i'll download maybe 20 songs every month and then uh, i'll divvy those up over videos that seem to fit. Uh, it depends on on. Yeah, I was just going to say, it depends on what sort of project that I'm doing. Um, Cause I do, I do a lot of, uh, pardon the term, but um, we've all heard it before is um, if I'm doing kite porn, um, then I, I like to use popular music that's really exciting and, and people know. Um, but if I'm doing something long-term, then I'll use something like uh, incompetech.com Incompetech, I don't know if you heard of that, but uh, yeah, it's royalty free stuff. Um, so tutorials, uh, long, long lasting videos that are going to be kind of referred back to over and over again. I won't use the popular music. When you use that popular music, um, I assume that's copywritten music. Are you, is it, is it staying up for a little while? I mean, are, or is YouTube muting it or? I, I, mean, I, I, have, I have pretty strange luck on that. Um, every once in a while I do get it muted. So that's why some of my stuff has now started going over to Vimeo. Yeah. Um, but you know, if it sneaks through YouTube and they put in their iTunes link, you know, there's sort of a, a hand in pocket unspoken agreement between the three parties that are going, you know, as long as you're not making a ton of money off this thing, we're happy to sell more on iTunes. It, it's that sort of thing, you know, um, yeah. it's still not legit, but, but it, we're, we have such a small footprint. I think that sure. it's, it's, it's non-consequential. Yeah. I know back in the day, some of our focus videos got muted on a couple of the songs that we used. So. Okay, guys, uh, thank you very much. And uh, it's time for me to move. So, JB and all other participants, I'm uh, making a move. Okay. Bye bye.
So uh, live talky videos. We don't see a lot of those in kiting. Um, it's one of the things I've thought about. So like you go into almost any other venue, whether it's um, inspirational speaking, which is, is obviously no brainer, but um, you know, you have these, these stars and these speakers and these experts on various topics and they just basically get the camera, they stick their face into it and they speak candidly. Um, I've referred to that as kind of getting naked and you just start to talk about what you love and, and do it without a lot of pretense and a lot of construct around it and just let your own mind wander and, and speak really candidly. Um, I've seen a fair amount of success with that. I really enjoyed uh, seeing Scott Weeder step out into some of those videos. And um, I don't know, we just, I don't see a lot of that in kiting. I see a lot of subject filming, but not us sort of showing really the inside and the heart of, of what it is that we feel about what we're doing. We're just kind of now burgeoning into that. I wonder if anybody else has had thoughts or experiments with that. Yeah, that's a great question. Everything I do is set to music. <laughs> I know there's a lot of it. So like Fletch does it, um, Brett does it. Um, they post their quad videos. I mean, I, just a few minutes ago, uh, Fletch was live, was showing a, a team fly that they're out doing this morning. Um, there's a lot of it, but uh, like before, there's no real organization behind it. It's just a Facebook post and that's it. Oh, it's okay, really quick. I'm so I'm chatting with you guys, and I'm also texting the people that I trust very dearly, like overseas, and I'm trying to get their input because they can't be here. Um, and I'm kind of trying to to combine the two. Um, I just got a really interesting set of messages from Chris um, involving kite videos and how it overlaps with advertising. Um, and essentially what we're talking about is like these advertising videos almost tend to be the popular ones right now, not popular, but like the ones that are like really hot shot stuff. Um, they tend to be a little bit shorter. They were very popular at one point. I think they're kind of dying out a little bit now. Um, I think John Bressy and uh, Hunter and really everybody that you're hitting on something really important because like we're, we're talking and texting right now and we're thinking like these videos are almost like, well, you're showcasing something right in the kite, but at the same time, where are you hiding? <laughs> like, because it's an advertisement video, which kind of goes back to like what we were talking about with, should there be a video pre looking at kiting videos of like what to look for? Because if you're not experienced, everything looks good. Like they can't, the kiting videos sometimes can lie to you. Um, so I think, I'm trying to find like a remedy to this. Would it, this might seem a little out there. Would it be worth it to do another one of these as like a watch party and like discuss what we're seeing in the videos, not slamming them, but like, like what we're taking in or just going straight to the live approach. Pants are overrated. Um, like, is there a way to, bridge this or is is this a way you know is, is this something that should just be thrown away i don't even know if this is a specific question it just it does seem a little strange that the really hot shot things tend to be well a, a sales pitch sometimes as opposed to again very candid raw getting naked Ooh, what you got there nice <laughs> I, don't know. Um, I, I, I think I think um, in part we're just dealing with some some symptomology there, uh, Devin. Is that the you know, we just have a really undereducated populace. Yeah. So you know we can it, to me a video like you're talking about is in the middle. It's not at the beginning of that. And I feel like we're all at this point now where we're trying to ramp up the grassroots education of the community on what good kites are and what good flying is and how to do good flying, as opposed to how to recognize it. Because if they don't even have the first parts yet, then you know, they can sit around and look at a video, but they don't understand the rest yet. So if you can bridge that in the middle, then then certainly. Yeah. So, so Devin, I think maybe we kind of put what you're saying together along with maybe what I was suggesting earlier. It's almost like if, if we are able to create a group of content creators and almost like have a monthly little meeting or something like that, where, and it's almost like, hey, that's a little challenge, like create the best whatever content, maybe give it a category, maybe it's just whatever it is. 
And then in that like monthly kind of meeting, it's like showcasing what you what you did during that month and then getting some constructive feedback or some feedback. And then maybe what you did inspire someone else. Or maybe it's even you just come in with like, ah, I had this idea. I'm not sure how to execute it. You inspire someone else or someone else gives tips. I don't know. Yeah. Something that could be fun. Mashups could be a, a fun time. That seems to be a hot thing in the performing arts world right now. Yeah. Like we're doing so many interesting multi-trackings and stuff. But, I don't know. I mean, how do, how would we form this group? Would this would this be like a Facebook I am little group de doop de? Um, what are we thinking? I mean, I'm not so I may not be up on all the different platforms and formats and all that kind of stuff. I mean, Facebook for me is something that's just so accessible and regularly used and, and everything and easy. But I mean, I'm certainly open to ideas if someone's like, nah, this would be a much better platform for this. I feel like maybe I think you're right on Facebook because I feel like if we, if we have to do something with an app that would imply phones or iPads or like a really modern computer, getting the video like to your phone to upload on the app, blah, 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 blah is just like kind of a pain in the ass. So like maybe taking a tiny video and just dropping it to a Facebook IM might involve less steps. I'm not sure if Facebook kills quality, but I think that's probably gonna happen in one respect or another. You know that? And then the other bit that that group could be used for as well is like going back to what Baresi was saying earlier about those raw, just, hey, point the phone on yourself, start talking kind of a thing. It's like not necessarily planning and unplanning it, but but it, like say if we knew that Devin's going to go on today at three and just start, you know, diary of the mouth on kites, you know, and, and what's in his head, you know, it's like we all know to get on there, but not beyond that we all have a lot of kite friends. You then, sh once he starts, you share it on your social media. And then all of a sudden it gets people on there. Cause I mean, I can go on there and I can just talk. Um, and Hey, that's great. But you know, it's going to be better, I guess, if someone's there to listen, um, that kind of thing. So I've, I've enjoyed if the I'm, ones that I've enjoyed the ones at Bressy that you've done in the past. Yeah. And, stuff. Been good. Well, and I think, I think if I'm following some of the point here that you guys have touched on is that um, something like Facebook, there's no, you know, it's like here coming to Google meet part of the resistance for me initially was that I've got to, I mean, even when I clicked the link, it didn't work. And so I've got to copy the code and then I've got to come over here and punch in the code. Right. But Facebook, man, I'm just looking through my feed and I see Hunter or Devin going off. I'm like, shit, man, I'll just camp in. I don't even have to check in. If I'm not feeling myself today, I can still sit there and listen to you guys and not not expose myself. Um, the other thing I like about that live available to everybody who's walking by thing is that it's it's really candid. It's really naked. You can't hide. Right. So everybody's going to put out their opinion, be responsible for it and then be able to churn it and then make new opinions on that, which I think is is really critical. Whereas um, when we have something polished or enclosed room, that in itself is slightly limiting. But when we're really naked, we're up against the whole community, I think it's just gonna accelerate everything faster, especially if we have um, experienced content creators and, and pilots in the room. So that, and I mean, one thing I'll say, like I've never gotten on there and done and, and done just like let loose on some talk and everything. And I think part of it is, I'll be honest, I mean, part of it's maybe like just being a little insecure or you know that kind of thing and like, is do I have something that is worth someone's time? Like, do, if I just get on there and start talking about whatever kites, whatever we did with Focus, whatever you know, my store. I mean, you know, any of that kite history stuff is, is that a value? And potentially having again a group that can potentially support someone and help help them feel more confident about doing that kind of thing could be good. Uh, that's um, you, it, there was you notice that sometimes I go quiet for periods of time. And that's exactly what it is. Is my my heart, my character are going through different waves and I don't feel like I can get naked, you know, and if I can't speak candidly, then I'm not going to speak at all. So that, it, yeah, that's, that's a very valid idea to have a room where people can um, kind of re-stimulate each other. Yeah, I'm going to agree with all of that um, and jump on the imposter syndrome bandwagon. It's a little <laughs> being someone in their mid twenties that is asked all the time to teach someone. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, you're like 60, like you have more life experience than me. Are you not able to absorb something that I can't comprehend? Um, so I, I tend to get a little weird in that respect. But um, I think what I have gathered over this Corona time 
with all of these meetings. It's not just this conference, but it's interesting that I thought, I don't want to generalize, but in essence, I almost want, I almost do. Um, it seems to me that a lot of kiters are external processors. Um, from what I'm hearing with all of this. And I, I think it's interesting that we spent the last 10 or so years um, internally, or I guess exclusively within a small group of people processing these things that we're acting on as opposed to doing this stuff. So I think like Nick is catching on to something and this, this time is, dare I say, good for us all to externally process all of this and realize that we're all kind of on the same page. It's just a matter of speaking different languages. Ooh, a little popsicle. Nice. Um, I'm just going to leave it at that. Yeah, I mean, I, I can definitely speak for myself. Like, again, if we had this group where you can kind of encourage, like, I can get on there and say, Devin, dude, you're doing some awesome stuff, man. I'd love to hear you just talk about, like, your your design process on the spur or, or, or whatever, you know. I, go do a, go do an online and let me know when it's going to be, and I'll jump on there and I'll listen and I'll share it. And, you know, all of us kind of get on there and, I know something like that would make me feel more, more secure in, in getting on and doing something like that if I know like there's people out there that want to hear it. Uh, I'm just going to jump in and say, I, I know that I've been one of, I'm sure many people who have uh, gone after Devin, um, especially after some of the first, uh, first meets and, and talks you were having where I was like, man, I, I just love hearing you expand. It was the, the on the line stuff um, that just kind of kicked you off, man. They, 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 it was a wonderful interview and I, and I love hearing you, you wander through your topics. And um, I think, you know, a couple of times I'm like, dude, don't you know who you are? You know, you're freaking deaf and cover more. So like, <laughs> you know, and you're totally disregarding that, but it's, um, um, I think my encouragement on that front is just not to worry about it. You know, you, you, you Focus on what you are so passionate about. If you're following that thread so hard, man, that's the validation itself. And, 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 and the response will define itself and it will redefine what you're doing as you go along. Um, I, I tend to just not worry about it myself. Um, uh, I, you know, I get, I get a lot of haters on the side and, and everything else, but I, I always go back to what I love. Um, this is maybe of use for anybody that gets in front of the camera. What I always do is, you know, I'll be in there and I'm talking about something on live Facebook and, and then my head will get involved and I, you know, the, the, the back me thinks about what they're thinking about me or something like that. And, and so what I've done is I've trained myself. I have an automatic. And what that is, is I go back to what do I love? And that's, I ask myself that purely and truly. And then once I have that recaptured, what do I love? I go back to the simplest thing that's in front of me. Um, uh, one of the things that like I, Paul DeBacher came in and did a, a dual line workshop with me. And he's, he's not one for given group workshops. But I'm like, all right, Paul, how about standoffs? Just give us 15 minutes on standoffs alone. So you take this little micro topic on something that he's known for 25 years. It's so inane. And then all of a sudden you open this giant universe out of it even though it's a tiny little thing. So those are the two techniques that I use. Go back to what I love, ignore everything else, and then choose something very, very simple that leads to so many other things in that realm that I love so much. That's what keeps me talking and speaking and out of my own head. Jump. Someone needs to share a link to that uh, interview Jump. you just mentioned with Devin. I don't think I've heard that. Jump. That's um. I'll, we'll try to find. I'm sure Devin's pulling it up right now. But for anybody that hasn't seen it, um, it was kind of short lived in its original form. It was the On the Line podcast, um, done by Matt Constable and um, assisted early on by Josh Mitchison and a couple other people. Um, they brought me on, they brought Devin on, um, and I think there was one other uh, known name that was in there. But uh, it was it was really cool, and it was kind of the first thing we'd seen like that in a long time. Since then, it's transitioned into um, focus more on live workshops. Um, so people have been doing build-alongs with quads and dual lines and things like that, which is also highly effective. But um, I, I would love to see somebody 
bring in another uh, candid interview sort of scenario. Um, I, I think it was wildly well received and, and it just kind of ended before it even began. I think I was sad to see it go. I do agree. I think I think some good candid interview stuff would be great. I mean, there's so many great personalities in kiting. I think it'd be really good. I feel like this is very strange. Nick hasn't come back yet, and we're all quiet-ish. Um, yeah, I'm just I'm gonna second out. I'm second all of this. Sorry, I was looking up all the installments of On the Line. Um, yeah, I think the only thing I can say is that we should probably keep doing this even post Corona, <laughs> um, even if it is just a tiny little fifteen minute check in. Um, I feel like it's it's a pretty universal thing that it's been helpful for everyone, if not, you know, from the respect of having to put on a different hat or thinking cap and walk it down the aisle of a fashion show if you will um, I don't think it hurts to give yourself the permission to get kicked so hard in your own ass that you reevaluate everything that you think about because you'll probably find a gem like say there's I don't know so there's just a bunch of coal sitting around in your brain well if someone compresses that and challenges that and turns that coal into a diamond well then hot damn so <laughs> like that's pretty cool. Um, lit as the youngins say. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't think, I, th I think we would be doing the kiting world an extreme disservice if we stopped doing this on, on the end of content creators and like the people that people are looking to for answers. Like, I think we need kind of this thing, whatever this is. Oh, tiny hunter. Oh my God. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to stop there. Um, the, the other two I, I want to jump in and throw out real quick, just because I've been down this road so many times, is um, we want to try to stay. I, I strongly encourage folks to stay out of the loop of asking the audience what they want because they don't know. They think they know, but they don't know. They don't have a clue. Um, we've seen it inside the organizations um, in every regard. I think it's really going to come down to the content creators themselves working in tight circle and just running rogue experiments and just just sending their stuff out there trying their ideas and and when it works then we feed on that when it doesn't work we feed on that too um one of the other things the two that i that i wanted to offer and i don't know if it'll be of use to anybody but one of the things that i've both partly thought my way into and then partly sort of found my way into is that um, I kind of have four different uh, nodes in my world of organization. So one is my own personal brand, um, which you, and again, this is all tongue in cheek, right? It's just, it's show for promotion and to, to fuel my own energy. So I always just speak frankly, but um, so you've got JB, which is the, the front brand. And that's me as a, a flyer and a performer um, in part, half of the education sort of thing. Um, and then just for title for organization in my own mind, we call it inspiration or kite porn, right? The things that somebody's on YouTube and you'd be like, man, I saw your video and I bought a kite. And as many of us have experienced um, with your own kites, your own energy. Um, so there's that note. And then another note is kite life. So kite life is not me. It's not my personality. It's a it's an independent nexus that's actually um, fueled by the people that are a part of it, um, which much in part is the, the forum community. Um, so they kind of own that. And so in that space is housed some of the things that I produce, education, um, tutorials, um, the discussion amongst other people out of print publications. So that's sort of like I always consider that Switzerland. Right. As opposed to me, which is all personality and opinion and generation. Um, and then now I have my my kite manufacturing, which has a different um, with Kite Forge, which is a different sort of different sort of kite porn. And there I'm getting more into the technicality of the products that we're making and why and how they how they can be applied in different areas. Like you've seen with the, the urban kite flying with the, the dual line. I'm just trying to create 
new ways that people will look at their own kites and hoping that other manufacturers also will either be kind of shamed into modifying, I'm predicting in the quad line world, particular details that should have been cured 20 freaking years ago. Um, and then the fourth element that I have is, um, is my team. And that, of course, is, is obviously kind of nullified in this space. But with the team, um, it ends up being more like a socialization engine and, um, and a recruiting platform. To, to find and identify other personalities, to, to make a family in which they, they feel strong, they feel happy, they feel safe, and they rise and start to produce their own content. And then they start to create their own notes. So they're basically the four legs of the table that I'm operating in. And each of them has a very different personality. And if now, having heard that, if you go back online, you'll kind of see the different voice that I have, depending on which channel that I'm going through. Um, so as you go through your own content, it may or may not be a benefit to periodically sort of review what sort of a tunnel it is that, that you're that you're trying to go down and then maybe even try to diversify those tunnels a little bit. Um, the other thing that I found as well is that it helps insulate some of my content from the other content. So if I catch shit in one area, it doesn't necessarily spill over into the others. But when one does well, you can cascade and connect. Um, the other thing, too, of course, is it helps you create a web so when you have at least three different personalities, for example, in Facebook, then you can start sharing in a circle and liking in a circle and it and it helps. And this is this isn't a tricky game, right? It's it's used. I try to I try to use that ethically and conscientiously, but um, hopefully the point was was relatively well explained. That's just what I had to say about that random insertion. Yeah, no, it was well explained. <laughs> Makes great sense. I'm going to go ahead and drop now. It's really nice to meet you guys. And take it easy. Enjoy the rest. I like sitting here. Yeah, nice to meet you as well. All right, take it easy. I said you too, buddy. I we're down to five. And then, and then there were, then, uh, let's see, five or oh, six. yeah, if we take your, no, we'll do five if we take your half and my half. <laughs> 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 yeah. We'll take it. Oh, but the quality is excellent. <laughs> hey, Hobie, do you like kites? Sure. Here, talking to this. Say hey, everyone. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Hobie. Uh, <laughs> I heard him. You heard him? <laughs> this is so weird. I remember, like, Teenage Hunter when I was, like, his size. And now you're, but you made that. <laughs> we we say the same thing about you. <laughs> so <weird. laughs> it's like ah, but oh oh. I made a kite. Yeah. Oh good. We need more of you. <laughs> I put my boy on, but he's not wearing any pants. So. <laughs> Can you hear him? Mm -hmm. Say hi, everyone. Hi. <laughs> All right. I'm just like done. Well, that's interesting. Oh, um, dang, this is still being recorded, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Oh, I want to ask a question, but I don't want to record it. <laughs> oh, Nick. Nick, come back. Hunter, you're muted. Is this the time where we talk bad about Paul and Nick, knowing that they'll hear it on the recording? We can. Yeah, yeah. Except they won't, they won't, they won't hear for like six months because they've got to review all the video that went before it. <laughs> yeah, You're like Hello. a time bomb. That's right. Interesting. Did so you go, know? Devin. You got six months to make amends. <laughs> oh, God. Wait, actually, this I might be able to have a roundabout way of asking this. Um, I know this was a. I don't actually. I don't know if this this ever overlapped. Hunter slash John, when you guys started building and like designing and sewing and, and I guess having this brand, right, of, well, I mean, you went with ITW with the Chimera, um, Hunter was involved with Focus before that, like, I mean, you were, you were literally the first flyer on Fantasy Tour, like throwing all those crazy 540s with the Jam Session Black Rainbow, like people start to associate these things like with your name. Did you ever, like, okay, so John, for example, like, Hypothetically speaking, the, the kaiju is, is a full-size kite now. Just hypothetically speaking. It is a full-size kite. It's been selling. Great. If you were to go out and throw a demo out with your old Shivas, which you are so fond of, 
has that or would that cause any weird turbulence like in this web of like why isn't he flying his own crap not that it's crap okay that's good to know um, yeah no yeah no, it, it, it um i don't take anything personally in that regard i never have those those lines just don't it, all those lines are absolutely blurred for me um so i could fly another manufacturer's kite in a demo if i like the kite it, it just doesn't make a whole lot of difference in that um but i want to backpedal in a little bit and say that i'm not I don't consider myself a true a true kite maker or builder or designer in in the greatest sense. I you know I'm 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 parlaying my experience as a pilot forward, um, but there are other people that have much more engineering knowledge. Yourself and Hunter and and, and so many others. So um, anyway, just want to clarify that a little bit. But no, it, it wouldn't bother me at all. Do you think it would bother people that are watching, or do you think it would make them think like? well, is this better than something that he's made? Like, why does he, why is he flying this? Uh, maybe I, but it's irrelevant to me. I, like, I don't, I, even now I don't, I just don't even, uh, I don't even feel the bandwidth to, to, to contemplate it. It's, it, it's, it's just moot to me. And if somebody has an opinion like that, it doesn't really have any bearing on why I chose to do one thing or another. Right. And I did it because that was right for me. And what they think is, is whatever they think we deal with that later. That makes sense. Yeah, I often find myself more stimulated by other people's work. Uh, actually, let, I want to touch back on that real quick because I think one of the things, and I found it to actually end up being a, a benefit, um, is is highlighting or showcasing other people's work. Um, you know, so so even though, especially once I came out with Kite Forge, one of the things that I did right away was I started getting, trying to get behind the other quad builders that I thought that were doing good stuff. You know, I, I got behind Polo and we had lots of backroom conversation. I tried to get behind Bazard on um, all these other folks. And basically like if I put a car in the race, I don't want to be out there alone. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to be going so fast that there's, there's nobody else in sight. Right. I'd rather be, have like five that are just like going nose and nose and nose and nose and all the way. Right. And then let the crowd sort that shit out. But if you've got five good racers in the race, you've got a show and you've got people to, you know, to come along and you have competition and you have camaraderie and friendship instead of trying to rend apart. Um, you know, I always describe it as building market because one of the things that kiting I often see manufacturers do is they fight over slices of a muffin instead of going out and baking cakes. And I'm all about baking cakes, man. I, let's get all the bakers in one room and make something bigger. And then we all are going to be able to have more muffins. <laughs> we all have our own muffin, like muffins. You know? Yeah, right. So so that point stands. Um, and so that kind of goes back to what you were saying is that is that hell yeah, I would I I'll fly a Shiva and, and then and then and then tell a little story about about Cavalier du Ciel and, and what it's all about and, and, and how that brought me all the way forward to now flying a Kaiju because I love a kite that's really full pressured like a Shiva because there's so few that are, you know, whatever it all parlays. And I think um, it always goes back to heart and reason. And if you go and think about what other people think too much, you're just going to get into this negative feedback loop. It's, it's an unreconcilable equation, right? You yeah. cannot, you can, you can never reconcile that because people are crazy. <laughs> we are crazy. We what? are, man. Especially when they're, <laughs> especially when you're in a herd situation like that. So um, that also kind of parlays back to why we have a room full of only content creators and we have other people that can watch and listen and participate, but we have to stay true to ourselves and, and follow that adaptation, you know, and we will always be forced into new levels of, of thinking and, and, and placement, but we got to stay true to ourselves. And if we go back into that external feedback loop, we're just going to get lost and broken, broken hearted yeah. as well. Well, that's fair. Hunter was gazing off into the distance, looking very stoic. <laughs> I'm, I'm watching a five-year-old at the same time as listening. It's, it, it's like watching the waves, man. <laughs> Yep. Mm. Yeah, I would venture to say that some um, all the the different um, showcasing that you've done, Devin, on other people's kites. You know, we've seen you talk recently. Um, you know, a fair amount about Benson's kites and and love hate relationship with with the the the, uh, the supernova. That it's all love now. 
Right, right. But <laughs> but, but, but but you're not but you're not letting go of the flip flop feeling because that's part of what made the kite and it makes the story. Um, uh, but but they're going back to the moral of the story is is you taking these moments and and showcasing other people's work and and even um, uh, having being recorded flying some of Ken's new kites and and having your name quoted as as being the pilot of that. All of that stuff is um, it shows an enormous amount of grace and and support in in showcasing all the racers on the line right that goes back to what i was saying originally so i just wanted to validate that more than anything no thanks i think there's i actually talked to ken about this a lot um and i mean john is just stuck with me because like, <laughs> so he's he's got to live in it so why um, well you came I from his loins so basically i'm like basically um, i feel like every second gen needs a first gen every first gen needs a 0.5 gen like every third gen needs a second you know you know what, what i'm getting at um because in and of itself that is that competition camaraderie factor that you're talking about it's just displaced over you know i don't know 20 30 years whatever defines a generation whatever um and that's i think that's what starts to produce something that's really good like if you think about it the the kites that are the new kites that are kind of on the radar right now have all, all of them have some level of partnership, whether that is a supernova, superfly, the spurs, the tikas, the gins. Um, I don't know if Brett did the kaiju, like the gin, the gin door, like you, you guys are like the names of these kites. Like, I don't know the single kite that is just being put out by one person. God forbid the slash, like look at Mott and Romwell, uh, the fulcrum. Carl, John, and now Romwell. Um, I don't know what I'm missing. I know Just of Eve is back. That's not a huge, a hugely known thing. Um, yeah, I can't think of a single one. And like even the Suru has been put. The Suru was all over the U.S. before he launched it. Like, I don't know. I, we, yeah, we need to kind of get back to that camaraderie thing. Well, and and this, this ties in so heavily to the content creation thing, right? I mean, it's, it, this, it, this goes back to, it. Um, you know, whether we're standing in front of a live camera or whatever it is. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about the technicality and the type of content. But I think a lot of the conversation has to keep kind of looping back to the heart of it and the camaraderie of it. Because it's almost, it almost wouldn't matter what the content is sometimes when that tone and that intent and that fami familial nature is is in play right i'm hunting blasters for a transformer <laughs> oh. i don't know does anyone, anyone else have something i feel i feel weird just just kind of blabbering Welcome back, Michael. You're finally the face, the guy who's liking all my all my my very rare Instagram stuff. It's uh, <laughs> nice to finally see you. <laughs> like, who is this HQ guy, man? This big old big old company is um, is obviously observing in real time and, and organically, like what cool people are doing, and it's just really neat to see it happening. So, but, uh, it's, been great, it, it, it's been great to hear your thoughts as well. I'm not working for HQ in any means. It's just a community thing we are we are involved in. Yes. I I really enjoyed what you had to say about the the uh, not I hesitate to use the word the the agenda, but the the spirit of of what it is 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 uh, getting in contact with people who. Uh, or finding contact with people who are very early in their lifespan. Yeah. So this is one of the concepts that I've considered um, as, a, as a content creator and, a, and an instructor is there is a lifespan for a kiter. And so on average, I find that that lifespan may be two to five years. That's usually about how long a kite flyer lives. Okay. You know, so somebody went into a kite store, they bought a, uh, an $80 dual line kite or, or whatever it is. And I find that most of that expiration is because um, the road to competency 
is so long and so dark, <laughs> it's very difficult to find what the, the base roots are for, you know, just knowing how to operate the vehicle and be successful. So people for the first two years are still trying to dig themselves out of not knowing their lines are unequal or how to flip the kite over on the ground. This most inane stuff that it, it should be compulsory to be successful at whatever it is you like to do. You might be a great trick flyer. You might just like to do spins and circles, but we all need the same fundamentals to be able to do that over and over again. Um, so that's, I, I've been trying to position myself earlier and earlier in the lifespan of the kite flyers. So I, I try to do that through YouTube videos or the tutorials and that sort of thing. And anything we can do to lengthen that lifespan and think about it somewhat in that context is really important. Um, and I think that a lot of the stores and the manufacturers aren't always as conscious of that as possible. Um, I've tried to work with the AKA a lot about that, um, not while I was president, but since then, especially with Kiting Magazine, um, is that, again, we just basically, you have three years, essentially, two to three years to land a kite flyer and, and get them successful and really happy. Um, and so not only competency, but connected to a community so that it means more than the activity itself. It means the friendships you've had or the, the experiences that you've had traveling or whatever it is. And then the third tier is recognizing the people that are shining enough that other people get some of that energy. Right? So I found kind of three primary tiers in the lifespan of someone who becomes involved in that community. Once more to recap, it's competency um, and then it's experience and, and connectedness. And then third is, is recognition and elevation for just the quality of what it is that they're doing, whether or not they're a master, but the, the raw smell, the, the feeling of it. So from a, from a content point of view, in your guys' opinion, is there anything special we can do to, to get earlier into that lifespan of, of the kite you just, you just talked about, John? Um, I, first, I, I think there are two things. Uh, well, there's, it's kind of threefold. Um, one is the, 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 the very first kites that people are buying. I think that the best uh, designers, we need to attack the beginner end because we very rarely go down there, right? So I think we should have like at least three or four $40 to $50 kites that are designed by badass kite flyers. Yes. And they have been battle proven. They're not they're and, and bless these people that are involved, but they're not new tech, you know, just junk that's not vetted. Um, it's really quality at really a good price. Um, and then with that, it used to be that the kite stores were staffed and run by people like us. Um, and frankly, they're just not anymore. There are exceptions to that rule. There are, you know, three or four that, that are. But for the most part, they're just shopkeepers. Uh, maybe they used to be kite flyers, but now they've got families and things like that. So they're not in a position to educate and land those kite flyers anymore when they buy that first kite. So along with that first kite, we need to figure out how to, um, I describe it as an ink pack. So when someone buys this $50 kite and then they go and they're standing on the beach alone and they've, and their little paper brochure has blown away, <laughs> where is the linkage? Where can they find Devin's face or Hunter's face or your face saying, I know where you're at. I feel, I felt what you're feeling and this is how we help you. Um, so some way to get in direct contact with video content or um, how to not let that piece of paper blow away. You know, it's that sort of detail so that we can help them bridge that gap. Um, so that is with how do we help the stores and how do we help the manufacturers because they are not in the um, emotional or experiential position to, to help land at the beginning of that lifespan. So we as experienced content creators, I think are, are in that position. And, and if we can put that into the product, it will help. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if, um, if there's anything to this. So, I mean, I'll just say it and there may not be anything. I mean, one thing that I, I've always been amazed at and I guess impressed by is the loyalty of a prism kite flyer. And you've got that prism kite flyers group out there and it's these people and all they know are prism kites. And I mean, they come in there and they get their Nexus and they're like, what's the next one I need to go to? And they go to their quantum. And then they, you know, it's like they, they, they hesitate to look off the prism route, but you know, it's like, golly, you know, it's somehow 
team, you know, tapping into that in a way. I mean, I, I don't know. It, it's just a thought. Uh, for some reason, it made me think Honor, of it. What is it. What is it about PRISM that does that? Try to quantify. What are the components that makes that happen? Uh, I mean, they, uh, to a degree, I mean, they've always done a great job of selling a lifestyle um, is one thing that they've always done right there. You know, I mean, they they were one of the first that I recall putting out lifestyle type images, the dad walking with the son, both holding a kite, you know, I mean, all that kind of stuff. Um, and they do a wonderful, wonderful job at it, you know, much respect to them for what they do. But, you know, it's so loyal and it's like, is Prism... Uh, servicing them well enough when it comes to helping them progress through kiting and retaining them through their life cycle, like you're talking about, John. Um, and there's a way that we can tap into that and help. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't know that Prism has had a direct hand on actually being a part of that life cycle. I think because of the lifestyle branding they've done, the community has formed itself inside that lifestyle. So they go to the Prism Forum and they talk with other Prism Flyers. And then what seals that all together is when they break a spreader and they call Prism and Prism sends them one for free, all wrapped up with stickers on it so you can't even mess it up. Um, that's all really nice touch, especially, again, considering that they're not actually present. You know, they're not there presently producing tutorials and getting personally involved with the process, you know. So uh, I do have a little bit of personal insight on the PRISM side, and I can't believe you guys are still chatting. This makes me so happy. I hate that I double booked everything for this morning. Oh, you should have um, caught the last 20 minutes, Nick. It's been hot, man. It's real uh, good. Well, thankfully, I get to go, you know, listen to the recording. Um, <laughs> yeah, we said, some, we said some really bad stuff about you, so. <laughs> you know we, what? I'm going to make We figure we got six months this. before you get to it. <laughs> Uh, but I, I can tell you, um, you know, I've been working a lot directly with Mark and talking about uh, some of his future plans and stuff like this. Um, there is there is a drive and there is intention and there's framework that's been created for um, kind of a little bit different tutorials for their products and engaging again and kind of revitalizing that whole um flight manual that they had and kind of revamping it and making it newer and more accessible for, for folks. Um, yeah, the, the big driver behind that is a gentleman named Keegan who works, uh, at prism. So, um, I know that's happening. They're also looking at creating more content and engaging with, with their community because, you know, like you said, they've, their community is unique. It's different. Like, they don't make people be brand loyal. People just are brand loyal and they're creating this massive community of I'm a prism flyer. And they're like, okay, here's a sticker. <laughs> right. Um, they're not demanding their community to be that way. The community just wants to be that way. They want to be associated with it. Um, so yeah, I know they're, they're creating something. I may be helping with that, but <laughs> So, okay, I got to go get this other session started. Jeez, guys, I love this. Yeah, I've, uh, I've, 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 it, it's never been a conscious process, but that's some of what's, um, what pushes what I do along as well as is, is a lifestyle thing, especially with the gin. Um, so the gin uh, to me represents this, this funk, like sort of B-boy kind of style of flying. And you see other people identify with that. So it's more than the kite. It's more than the product. It's, it's like, like people who, who get into that kite, they kind of feel like, well, I got this kite. I can just like uncork and like, you know, it just just get freaky now. Um, so it's it's very different. It's not as much about branding, but about what it means. And I think everybody's kind of working towards finding that whatever that is for their for their product or, or efforts. Hey, I've got to run, everyone. It's been awesome to talk to everyone so much this weekend. Really appreciate it um, and look forward to talking to you guys a lot more soon. Thanks, Nick. Thanks for everything. <laughs> Preempted, Devin. That's hilarious. <laughs> She's like That's, a switch. Yep. Just nope. <laughs>
<laughs> Devin's talking again. Just nope. <laughs> Grain of salt, Devin. Grain of salt. You're awesome. Um, if you guys don't have anything more specific for me, I'm I'm probably going to go and, and do my dadly thing as well. Yeah, I'm probably going to yeet on out of here. Um, cool. Let's find Thanks, time. Okay. Yeah, Nick, make this happen again. Yeah, I was about to ask, Is did you guys talk about if there's going to be a follow-up of this create uh, content creation chat or in the time I was gone? Uh, there will be. I just have to uh, free up some space on my computer to create it and get it scheduled and get all the invites out. Um, right now, uh, I've got probably <laughs> 15 windows open. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> But I'm going to make it happen. Uh, it, you'll probably see invites or uh, some information on Monday that goes into like, uh, yeah, yeah. We'll make it happen. We'll figure it Perfect. out. Um, Thank you. Do we want to start a little Facebook group for content creators to just post crap? I've got one. I'll invite you to it. OK, let's do that. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks. Nick. OK. I'm yep. I'll post it on the Fortuna Fountain. Actually, hold on. Ah, crap. Just a second. What am I holding on to? Hold on to your butt. Hold on. All right. We'll pull it to the arm. Straps. Yep. Uh, kind of here strap? we go. Do they have studs on them? Yes. Okay. Anything for you, my dear. Hey. Some, sounds like you've been to my house. <laughs> <laughs> this must be where I got the bruises. This is recorded, isn't it? Great. <laughs> yep. Don't worry. I can I can cut this portion out. <laughs> no, 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 no. Leave it and set it to your ringtone for me. There you go. Thanks. Yep. Yep. And I'll I'll feel free to invite. Uh, yeah. Oh, you just made this group. Uh, no, I made it last year. Why are you the only member? Because everyone else left what? and no one was engaging. So <clears throat> yeah. Great. Okay. All right. I'll see you guys later. Okay. I'll see you. Thank you everybody. Much love. Yeah. Talk Bye -bye. to you guys soon. Bye. Bye.